Hi, everyone. My name is Santosh Sikar, and welcome to tonight's event. I'm on the board of the Columbia Business School Alumni Club of New York, and I want to briefly introduce the club. We put on many in-person and virtual educational networking and social events every year, spanning a range of interests. Although the school is supportive, they don't offer financial support to us. So the club relies on dues and event revenue to operate. For those of you that aren't yet members, if you like tonight's event and want even more, get on our mailing list and join the club. Here's why we're here tonight. Private investment funds are large and growing in size, complexity, and number. According to SEC statistics through Q3 2021, there are over 37,000 US private funds collectively with gross assets under management of $18 trillion. And these numbers exclude advisors that aren't yet able to report their figures to the federal government. The dollar value of investments in private funds are at a peak and the number of fund managers continues to proliferate. Given the level of investment in private funds and their important role in the US markets, we thought it'd be topical and relevant to our members to have a comprehensive discussion about private funds from two industry veterans who have joined us this evening. Jonathan Golub and Evan Katz are eminently qualified to lead this discussion. Jonathan Golub is a partner in and the chair of the Fund Formation and Investment Management Practice Group at Wigan and Dana in New York. Jonathan has over 20 years of experience advising established and emerging domestic and offshore fund managers on private fund formation and regulatory compliance. He helps managers launch hedge funds, venture capital funds, and other bespoke investment vehicles of all sizes, along with their related investment advisor and general partner entities. Jonathan also represents family offices and high net worth investors in connection with their direct investments and third party managed alternative investment vehicles. Evan Katz is the founder of Crawford Ventures, a leading Manhattan based alternative asset alternative investment firm that forms, grows, holds interest in, and raises substantial investor capital for compelling hedge funds, private equity funds, and other alternative investment funds. Evan is a twice elected director on the Hedge Fund Association Board of Directors, on which he served from 2014 to 2019. He was also voted and nominated by the hedge fund industry as its best fundraiser in the 2021 Hedge Week Awards, and is highly regarded as an expert on alternative asset best practices, institutional investors, family offices, and successful large-scale fundraising. And just as a quick reminder to all attendees, please put all questions for our guests in the Q&A section so we can see and eventually answer them. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to Jonathan to start the discussion. Thank you very much, Santosh. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to speak to uh, so many distinguished alumni of the Columbia Business School, um, and, uh, and also to be joined by a friend I've known for many years, uh, Evan Katz. It's a very exciting opportunity to um, speak alongside Evan. Uh, we've known each other in the industry for many years. Uh, and um, uh, hopefully between the two of us, everybody here will uh, have some interesting takeaways and maybe have a little bit of fun in the process. I know when a lawyer leads a panel, it can get kind of dry. People tell me that all the time. I'm going to try to avoid making this dry. I'll try to be engaging. Um, though some of the topics we'll discuss might start off being a little dry until we get into some uh, discussions uh, about uh, real world war stories and the like. Um, and I noticed uh, just as we were beginning, somebody asked uh, to start off with what is a private fund? So interestingly, that's exactly where our presentation starts. So uh, let me just uh, see if I can get into the next slide. So as, as you'll see, we'll cover a bunch of topics today. Um, I wanna note though, this discussion is meant to be high level and cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. So we're gonna to try to get as much into this as possible and kind of skim the surface on different topics of relevance to fund managers like basic fund structures and definitions, um, features of different kinds of funds, you know, who plays a role in regulating and uh, staffing fund managers different kinds of investors and how to market to them um, and uh, certain other topics that might be more within Evans wheelhouse in addition to marketing, but also just uh, 
what's appealing to investors and how do you measure performance and things like that. If there's time, we'll even get into some special situations for managers. So private funds, somebody asked, what is a private fund? So I've listed, here's some of the dry stuff, but it's important to walk through it. There's a treatise definition, there's the statutory definition, and then there's just the uh, uh, general collective wisdom of what a private fund is. So you can see up here on the screen, it's a privately offered investment vehicle that pools capital uh, provided by sophisticated or institutional investors and it's managed by a professional. Um, there is a legal definition um, and what we're talking about today uh, is a pri private fund is essentially a fund that is not regulated under the Investment Company Act and specifically is excluded under sections 3C1 and 3C7 under the Investment Company Act of 1940. I'll explain a little bit later what that means, um, but effect effectively, these are funds that are lightly regulated and we're not talking about mutual funds or ETFs. So uh, mutual funds, ETFs, any regulated funds that are typically marketed to retail investors are not private funds and they're excluded from today's discussion. Um, and uh, what we're talking about again, private funds also means they're privately offered. So they're not only exempt from regulation like a mutual fund, but the securities that the funds are being, that are being offered to investors are also exempt from regulation under the Securities Act of 1933. There's something called a Regulation D, Private Offering Safe Harbor. Many people on this call are probably already familiar with it, but essentially as long as the fund is not um, publicly advertised or generally solicited, um, that is a privately offered fund and it um, works for purposes of uh, Rule 506B. There is something called a Rule 506C exception, which does permit public advertising or general solicitation of the fund, but is still considered a privately offered fund. And um, it's an interesting area. I don't have an... I, I know you and I have been talking about 506C funds. What are your thoughts about those as opposed to a 506B fund? Sure, Jonathan. It's a question that I definitely do get a lot. And uh, thanks to uh, the Columbia Business School Alumni Club of New York for having both of us. Uh, the, to Jonathan's question, uh, so-called 506C funds are, were permitted under the JOBS Act, J-O-B-S, all caps, Act, about 10 years ago, uh, which generally permits a 506C fund to, uh, and I'll put this in air quotes, advertise, basically meaning that they can spread the word about their fund publicly, which typical 506B funds cannot, so long as that the fund makes sure that all the, uh, all the investors eventually are accredited or qualified purchasers. So there was a huge to do to your point when 506C came around because then hedge funds could quote unquote advertise I don't mean the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, but they could speak publicly, they could go to conferences, they could put their results on a website, uh, all of which their lawyers would tell them they could not do for the past 50, 60, 70 years. The, uh, the interesting thing is though, that a lot of folks have not done 506C, I guess for two reasons. We'll get into more of this later. One of them is, if you're gonna to try to raise a fund, you should have a fundraiser yourself or someone else already knows the investors and shouldn't have to find new ones. And that's one reason. And the other thing is, is that 506C was just not the SEC's favorite thing. It was kind of uh, passed over their, uh, not with their objections, they weren't thrilled about it. And this is semi-public. So the irony is that 506 came along about 10 years ago, 506C, a lot of people thought it was gonna be the biggest thing to hit hedge funds in a long time, especially for emerging managers. But the last time I checked, and Jonathan, you know, cause you form a lot of hedge funds, probably no more than 5% of funds have done 506C because at the end of the day, you really have to know the investors from the get-go and not try to find new ones if you're going to be successful. Is, is that 5% number roughly what you're seeing or even less? Even less. It's a very rare thing. Uh, my view is a lot of fund managers are reluctant, partially because of what law firms like my own are advising them, uh, which is to not do it because it's not well tested. There's um, potential risk. If you're starting to put advertisements out there on social media um, or elsewhere, things change within the firm and you inadvertently have put 
advertisements or marketing materials out there that don't reflect the reality of what you're oper op operationally doing, um, that could inadvertently lead to um, SEC scrutiny and regulation. And another piece of it is if you're going to attract investors in a 506C offering, um, you must vet them and make sure that they're accredited investors before they come into the fund. Um, the traditional 506B offering um, would is a little bit more permissive as long as you've established what's called, called a pre-existing substantive relationship with an investor. If they just check off the box and self-accredit on a questionnaire and you have a reasonable uh, belief that they are actually accredited investors as they've indicated, that's enough. You don't have to do a so-called root canal on their finances or ask them to send you an accountant's letter. So um, it's much, it's a little bit more difficult and I think off-putting to investors to be asked to, to provide supplemental material just to verify their accredited investor status, um, which is what 506C requires. Um, <clears throat> and that gets into the second point here about investors must be accredited investors in private, privately offered funds. Uh, as I said, you can either, and, and accredited investors are defined later on uh, in this uh, presentation, but um, it's a minimum sophistication standard for investors to get into these funds. Um, there are two kinds of private investment funds that are very often formed. There's um, what I call a 100 person fund or section 3C1 fund. And there's a QP fund or a qualified purchaser fund which is a section 3C7 fund. 3C1 and 3C7 again are investment company act exemptions. This is how you form a fund that is not regulated like a mutual fund. So if you have less than 100 investors and they're all accredited, you have a 3C1 fund. If you have um, investors that both meet the accredited investor standard and the qualified purchaser standard, which is a much higher standard to meet, then you have a 3C7 fund. And by the way, that 100 investor limitation goes away. So um, well-connected fund managers or people who know Evan Katz um, are going to have an easier time raising a QP fund because they have access to more institutional kinds of investors and can bring more into the fund and reach a critical mass um, with their regulatory assets under management faster with that kind of a fund. Hey, Jonathan, real, real quickly on that point too, I think, you know, for the qualified purchasers, I mean, out of the thousand allocators we have relationships with, 99% are qualified purchasers because you're not going to raise a 50 million, $100 million fund, or certainly not a 500 or a billion million or a billion dollar fund with accredited investors. Because if accredited investors have a net worth of a couple of million dollars, they're only going to be putting in maybe $100,000 or $50,000 into any one particular hedge fund. So, you know, the key thing here is if you want to have a successful private fund, whether it's hedge, venture, private equity, what have you, you, you definitely want to get some partners or fundraisers who know the endowments, the foundations, and the pensions, the so called qualified purchasers or institutional investors, you know, because a lot of artists have billions of dollars in assets. So, you know, they give some money to private equity and hedge and venture. And each of those funds would typically get maybe 20 to $200 million per investor per fund. So you're absolutely right. You, you can form a 3C1 fund and have credit investors. But if you're trying to get to the promised land of a couple of hundred million dollar fund or a couple of billion dollar fund, it's gonna be pretty much impossible to get anywhere near there you know, with a 3C1 fund. I mean, would you agree with that just on, on the math? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I have, had clients who's many clients who start off with 3C1 funds, but that's usually um, when they're first time fund managers and they're trying to get a track record. They're trying to, maybe they're just raising money from friend, friends and family. And it acts either as an incubator fund or um, just a you know first stage fund. The idea being though, as you said, get to the promised land with your fund two or fund three, you can switch over and start forming 3C7 or QP funds. And um, and by the way, you can have qualified purchasers invest in a 3C1 fund because they will likely be accredited investors anyway. But um, it's not as typical. You know, that's usually late stage fundraising um, or more established fund managers when they're raising capital, they're in a position of bringing QPs 
you're not typically intermingling, intermingling the accredited investors and the QPs. Yeah, or, or at a practical level, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, if the initial, uh, you know, the four, the four reps are typically the first four types of investors in a fund, friends, family, former colleagues, and former coworkers, folks like that. And a lot of them, if they are accredited, can go into the 3C1 fund. And then you can bring qualified purchasers into the 3C1 fund as you build the fund and either uh, have a handshake deal or have something in the subscription documents or you know, legally binding or just in a gentleman's agreement that when the 3C1 fund approaches 90 sub investors that you can then move all the qualified investors into the qualified purchaser fund. And I, don't, I think you can do it without there being any tax issues, but that's something maybe for a different conversation for a different day. But one question we do get a lot from funds is can you have both? So yeah, you can have a 3C1 and a 3C7, uh, but you obviously raise a lot more you know, with, the, with, the, with the 3C7. But yeah, you can get started with a 3C1 and get the snowball, get the ball rolling. Yes, yes. We'll get into that a little bit more when we look at fund structures uh, and particularly parallel funds. Um, all right, let's uh, move to the next slide. Let's see if this will work. Maybe not. No, I seem to be frozen. Hmm. All right, here we go. Uh, legal framework and cast of characters. Um, I'll talk about the legal framework and Evan, maybe you talk about the cast of characters. Um, so I've already mentioned the Investment Company Act of 1940 and the Securities Act of 1933. Those are two very important bodies of law to uh, keep in mind. The Investment Advisors Act of 1940 is an incredibly important um, body of law and sometimes gets overlooked by fund managers and even their counsel sometimes. Um, it relates to the registration status of the investment advisor or the management company to the fund. Um, and there are exemptions from registration. If we have time, we'll talk about that. Uh, but all of these bodies of law, plus the Exchange Act, Commodity Exchange Act, ERISA, and the Internal Revenue Code, all touch on fund structures. So earlier when I said that private funds are lightly regulated, um, there, I had to bite my tongue a little bit because they are and they're not. They're not mutual funds, but they are, there are certainly uh, many bodies of law that uh, impact how you structure the funds, how you market to investors, um, and, uh, and, and the like. And these are all act as a constraint on your activity if you're a private fund manager. Um, on top of the bodies of law, there are all these regulators. I call them the alphabet soup of regulators, and some of them are very familiar, the SEC, of course, um, CFTC, or the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, if your strategy includes commodities or futures trading. Uh, FINRA, which regulates broker-dealers. Um, the Treasury Department does, in some cases, regulate private funds, um, particularly when it comes to um, AML, um, anti-money laundering rules, uh, Office of the Comptroller of the Cur Currency, to, to a certain extent, CFIUS, which um, I won't get into right now, but it's a whole other um, issue if you have foreign investors investing into the US and your strategy involves investing in uh, sensitive technologies like, sp like space related technologies, defense technologies and the like. Uh, the Department of Labor will regulate you if, um, if, you, are, uh, if you have uh, benefit plan investors in your fund. Um, then there's state level laws, which you can imagine Delaware corporate law and LLC laws uh, investment advisor regulations at the state level and international laws. Um, but I think what's more interesting is what Evan's gonna talk about, which is all of the different um, entities and service providers that support the formation and structuring of a fund. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, it really is uh, the cast of characters, uh, a 360 degree group of folks who support folks. Uh, uh, the administrator, as it says here, basically uh, helps to administer the fund. Uh, they do, as Jonathan said, the calculations, the onboarding, fee calculations, uh, AML and KYC. Now, when I started this business about 20 years or so ago on the alternative space and the hedge fund space, 
Uh, there were funds that did what they called self-administering. They did not have an independent third-party administrator. They did their own calculations, their own onboarding, uh, their own reporting and everything else. And strictly speaking, uh, legally, I believe you still can self-administer, but from a practical standpoint, it is going to be extraordinarily difficult to get third-party investors, uh, any institutional investor, any sophisticated investor, if you are so-called self-administering still, you really do need a third party administrator or as we call them admins, because it's an extra set of eyes to make sure that you're doing what you say you're doing and not doing what you're not saying you're doing, what you say you're doing. Similarly on the accounting side with the audit, uh, you will obviously need, if you wanna raise significant capital, a well-known auditor. It could be one of the big four. It does not have to be one of the big four. Uh, in many countries, including the US and uh, many parts of Europe, there are accounting firms with three, four, 500 accountants and auditors that are below the big four. Uh, if you need any introductions, I'm happy to do it. Uh, and similarly on the prime broker side, uh, typically these are folks who work with hedge funds. They lend them securities when they sell uh, stock and shares short, and they provide leverage for those hedge funds that are levered, which many funds are, uh, but some aren't. And obviously, you know, law firms, you want someone who knows the ins and outs of funds intimately as Jonathan and, and Wigan do. You know, and the bottom line is this, uh, you really do want to have the best service providers, you know, that you can afford because investors get hundreds, if not thousands of pitches a year. And they are to some degree, largely true kind of checks the box types. You know, do you have a good team? Do you have a good track record? And we'll get at the track record later. Do you have a good staff of people, internal, external, and who are your service providers? So, you know, I, I've said on a couple of panels, you know, would you invest in a fund whose auditors were three folks in a strip mall in White Plains? And most people said no, uh, but for those who are old enough to know the reference, uh, the Madoff firm was a multi-billion dollar firm. Their auditors were literally three guys in a strip mall in Westchester County, New York. So those days are long gone and for obvious reasons. So if you want to attract capital, you want to have the best people sitting around the table supporting you that you can afford. And well, one thing I'll say too, a lot of the service providers have some flexibility. It's what I call the, uh, the Evans special. Many of them will work with emerging managers. They're selective whom they take on, but if you've got a compelling team and a compelling track record and you're likely going to be successful, most will have a little bit of flexibility on the fees for the first year if it looks like a promising client. So when investors are looking at your deck, you want to have names they've seen before uh, and that they know are A plus and are going to help you become successful. Thanks, Jonathan. Sure. Of course, the, the law firms are on there too. Um, you know, speak to your lawyer if you have any questions about everything I've already mentioned with the legal structures, the, um, the laws that govern funds, but also uh, contractual uh, negotiations and do that early, um, including, um, you know, Evan was talking about administrators and accounting firms and prime brokers. All of them want you to sign an agreement with them before they even onboard you. Uh, and uh, those uh, should be reviewed because um, every time I review them, and I, I apologize to any administrators or accounts who are on this call, but every time I review these agreements, I see um, they're very one-sided against the manager in many cases, particularly when it comes to indemnities and liabilities. I know there are arguments pro and con on that, uh, but um, you should at least have somebody reviewing these and letting you know where the pitfalls are. Um, there are other characters, third-party placement agents. Um, don't wanna to get too much into that. These are people who are registered as broker dealers and can find investors for you in exchange for a fee. Um, that's also a negotiated agreement. And um, again, lots of issues come up with uh, third-party placement agent agreements. You may need to have a regulatory consultant, particularly if you're getting ready to register as an investment advisor. Um, and uh, you need to be prepared to go through a presence exam by the SEC. Um, and the SEC also has been... Uh, very focused on cybersecurity issues over the last few years. Lots of hacks uh, uh, of private data, private investor data. Plus there are um, various states that have enacted privacy laws that go above and beyond what the federal um, rules are. Um, I know, for example, Connecticut right now is considering a bill that um, will um, 
raise the bar on how anybody who's dealing with uh, private investor information um, with uh, Connecticut residents, um, it's going to be, it's going to raise the compliance bar for you as well. Um, so cybersecurity and IT is probably good to, to know. Uh, fiduciary and trust services, they help you establish independent um, uh, independent director relationships. Um, some investors, particularly institutional investors, like to see some independence on the management team. Somebody looking over your shoulder is not um, as interested um, in the business. Um, and there are service providers that can uh, appoint those for you. Um, so let's do one, 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 one more thing I'll yeah. say, Jonathan, too, real quick about you know, lawyers and accountants. Uh, obviously, great lawyers are great lawyers, great accountants are great accountants. But another function they serve, too, is they work with tons of funds and they can help managers as they're building a new or emerging fund with a lot of the terms of their funds. So we'll get into some of this later. Uh, but Jonathan, you and I have worked together extensively. And one of the things I appreciate about you is not just the legal knowledge and our accountants that we work with, but when there's a question about, you know, what are some of the current trends and terms for redemptions? or business terms in the agreement, uh, or gates, and we'll get into gates later. Uh, if your accountants and lawyers know funds inside and out and have done hundreds, if not thousands of funds and still do, they, like Jonathan and Wigan, can have a very good sense of where the industry is in terms of you know, what a gallon of milk costs, what the appropriate terms are, where if you're just starting out, you may have a great fund, but you have no idea where the industry presently is you know, on May 11th, 2022, when it comes to gates, redemptions and other things as well. So that, that's an important thing. Thank you. Um, and by the way, um, there are a couple of questions for Evan I'm seeing in the, in the chat. I think we're gonna hold off on those until we get into a little bit further in on, um, and when we get to marketing to investors there's a whole section of this presentation. And um, Evan, you've got some, some people asking really good pointed questions for you. I don't know if you're seeing it there, but uh, we'll get to those. Um, and then Santosh uh, asked, what are some don'ts when, uh, when starting a fund? Uh, which is an interesting, very interesting question. So things to avoid. Um, one thing that I don't get enough of an opportunity to tell my clients, uh, because often they want to just launch um, and uh, they don't want to hear anything negative from um, from their attorneys uh, right off the bat. But I would say don't devalue compliance early on in the in the process. I think there is a and, and this is in the presentation later on also, but there's this um, sometimes some people jump in and say with a uh, kind of build it now, fix it later attitude. Um, and that could that could be a real problem if you're not if you're operationally not up to par, uh, because in, in investors are going to see that, um, especially if in a DDQ or, or an on-site interview. Um, and um, I, I think investing in the compliance function, even if you're not a registered investment advisor, can pay dividends later on, um, because it shows you have a good business head on your shoulders. Um, it shows that you're, um, you have a long-term view of your business and, um, and that you want to establish a good tone at the top, um, which is a term of art that I see um, that the SEC uses all the time. It just means that you've established a culture within your firm of doing the right thing, abiding by your fiduciary duties, um, making sure that uh, all of your operations are focused on aligning your interests with your LPs, avoiding conflicts and that kind of thing. And we could talk about compliance programs either later today or maybe in a second session. Yeah, Jonathan, um, just, just to agree with you, I think it's, it's an excellent point. Uh, and whether you have a full-time CFO and we'll get to that later or a chief operating officer, you know, even if you're a quote, only a $50 million fund, you can do most things as if you're a billion dollar fund. So even if you don't legally have to at some point have a complete compliance manual and program, there's no reason why you shouldn't. Then you can point out to your investors that out of the two dozen things that you will do when you're fully registered, maybe you're doing out of the 24, you're doing 20 of them. And that can be pretty impressive. So uh, you don't want to wait till the last minute where you cross the threshold to become compliant, to be scrambling then. You, know, you can do 90% of things, even when you're small, that you should be doing when you're big. 
Thank you, Evan. Um, so this is just an interesting, another lens through which you can uh, think about investment funds um, through an accounting lens. And I am not an accountant. And so I'm going to kind of race through some of these concepts. I, I'm sure there are accountants on this call who could um, add a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of insight here. But if we're talking about domestic private funds, they're often established as limited partnerships or limited liability companies. Those entities are um, treated as pass-through vehicles for U.S. tax purposes, meaning they're not taxed at the entity level. Um, the individual investors receive K-1s and they're taxed on their allocable share of gains in the fund. Um, so what's really happening is um, you as the fund manager with the help of your accountants and administrators um, are tracking performance on a capital account by capital account basis. So every investor in the fund has a capital account, reflects gains and losses um, or their share of gains and losses um, of the fund. And um, I put some sample you know, language in here um, that, pull, that pulls right from a very standard partnership agreement on capital account maintenance. But essentially somebody on your team, either internally or externally is calculating um, the amount of uh, cash or property you've contributed to the fund plus allocations of partnership income um, and subtracting out allocations of partnership partner loss and deduction. Um, and uh, that's essentially what happens. So at the end of an accounting period, which might be a month, um, semi-annually, quarterly, or at the end of the year, there is a, a valuation placed on, on that investor's capital account. And if, the, if we're talking about hedge funds, um, different investors will have different values or different values attributable to their capital accounts depending on when they came into the fund and, um, and the way uh, gains were allocated to them. Plus, um, to the extent there are any management fees charged to them and performance allocations or performance fees uh, deducted from their accounts, there could be different uh, calculations and results um, on an investor by investor basis. Uh, Evan, I don't know if you wanna talk on, on this point, um, it's a little bit more accounting related. Maybe we move on. Yeah, I'll put it this way. I'm a recovering lawyer, but I'm not a recovering accountant. So the only thing I'll mention on this point is that, uh, to your point, Jonathan, uh, there sometimes are investors who pay slightly different fees. Uh, we always try to keep things sort of at the off the rack rate, but you know, no surprise if a pension or an endowment wants to put in 50 or $100 million to a fund I'm working with, and they request a slightly lesser fee, typically on the management piece, to your point, Jonathan, yeah, there can be slightly different fees. And if someone's going to put $100 million in, you know, it's what's the old expression, it's cheaper by the dozen, they'll get a slightly better rate. Yeah. Um, so here we go. We're getting into a little bit more of the fun stuff here. Um, I've talked about hedge funds a little bit. Um, many people on this call probably are already familiar, at least colloquially, with the difference between hedge funds, and private equity funds. And by the way, when I say private equity, I'm also referring to venture capital funds. Um, so th they have different profiles, uh, as you can imagine. Um, hedge funds uh, deal with more liquid securities, uh, securities were with a readily ascertainable value. Um, those would be stocks, bonds, commodity futures, uh, derivatives, and um, and other. I'll put their their miscellaneous other. Uh, investments that are liquid. Private equity funds, what are they investing in? Uh, privately placed securities of companies. Um, it may be um, shares of a startup that um, has, uh, there may not be a great uh, valuation yet, or may, there may be an inability to value those shares um, at the beginning. And so um, as a result, they, there are different liquidity profiles for each fund. So um, hedge funds, and, and as a result, with hedge funds, you, you as the investor can uh, get in or out um, on a rapid or relatively rapid basis, although the terms differ from fund to fund. Some um, hedge funds are starting to bleed into private equity fund territory and can be called hybrid funds, where um, 
their capital is locked up for longer periods, but the traditional hedge fund would permit um, even monthly redemptions or withdrawals. Um, private equity funds hang on to your capital for a very long term um, with the idea that the, eventually the underlying assets will uh, experience an exit um, at multiples of the um, original value or the uh, basis in those shares. And so um, your capital is locked up, but there is a, a good chance that you get 3x or more on your investment in a private equity fund. It can be, um, and sometimes there are some real home runs hit in private equity funds, which make it um, worthwhile to stay in for the, for the 10 or 12 year term that they uh, typically offer. Um, and a big difference is the way fees um, are charged. So hedge funds charge an annual management fee, usually one to 2% based on the, um, you know, the managed assets of the fund. Um, and performance fees um, or performance-based compensation, which can be charged as a fee or an allocation um, which is accounting an accounting term. So if the performance is paid out as a fee, it's treated just like the management fee and it's a deduction. If it's a performance allocation, um, again, apologies to the accountants on the call who could probably explain this better than me, but um, essentially the, the gains um, usually up to 20%, so somewhere in the realm of 15 to 20% on the portfolio um, are allocated away from the fund to the general partner and the remaining 80 to 90% or so um, stays with the um, limited partners. Um, so that's uh, essentially, and, and by the way, when you're talking uh, that the vernacular for private equity funds that performance fees referred to as a carried interest, it's a, or that, that allocation is referred to as a carried interest, but it's the same concept, um, essentially an allocation of the gains, 20% of the gains to the GP instead of treating it as a fee. And there are tax consequences to either one, which I'm probably not the best qualified to get into. Yeah, Jonathan, I'll just say two things on this slide real quick. Uh, yeah. uh, the, first, the first thing was with regard to fees, uh, fees are typically regular income to the manager where uh, the so-called carried interest, the performance allocation means that the invest that the manager rather gets 20% typically of say the hedge fund profits, but takes them as if he, she, or it is standing in the shoes of their investors. So if the hedge fund, for example, and some do have long-term capital gains or qualified dividends or 60, 40 long-term on certain futures contracts. And again, we're not going to get to that on this on this call and on the Zoom, but there sometimes can be tax advantages where if it's an allocation, the manager can get the tax advantage that the manager's investors are getting. Now, recently Congress changed things so that the, man the hedge fund manager has to jump through a few more hoops to get the tax advantage that their investors are getting. And that's a more recent thing, but that's typically why it's been an allocation because the manager stands in the shoes of the investor. And one more point quickly too, with regard to the carried interest, uh, for historical reasons, and I think historical reasons alone, private equity funds have typically had um, a, uh, a percentage, five to seven percent, a benchmark that they had to meet before they got a share of the profits. So typically in private equity venture capital, it's maybe five to seven percent, a preferred return to the investor, as it's called, and the investor gets that part of the profits first, and then they split what happens afterwards, of splitting the profits afterwards. On the hedge fund side, in contrast, for historical reasons, the overwhelming majority of hedge funds do not have uh, any preferred return or hurdle rate, as it's called, that first goes to the investor. Just historical difference, and but that it still lives to this day. Yep. Uh, Brandy Coates asked, uh, how important is it to work with lawyers and accountants that specialize in specific fund types, for example, hedge funds versus VC funds versus family office funds, et cetera. Evan, what's your... Uh... Uh, sure, I, I would say that most accounting firms and law firms have practitioners that are experts uh, in all of those areas, especially the mainstream one, hedge, venture, private equity, real estate. Uh, that said, it is a fair question to ask. I mean, certainly the big four firms and we've worked or consulted or spoken to all of them at this point, and then the ones just below them, they are gonna have teams that do 
hedge, venture, private equity, real estate, alternative energy, ESG, uh, futures, commodities, you know, you name it. And now, of course, uh, we haven't mentioned it yet, so I'll be the first one to do so, cryptocurrency. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I think the answer to the question is yes, it is important to work with lawyers and accountants and administrators who know your type of fund. But for all the mainstream strategies, all the mainstream firms, large and medium, are going to have somebody. But if you're going to a small firm that's only done hedge funds, they may not know much about crypto. They may not know much about real estate. So, you know, it's definitely worth asking. But any, if you go to the large department store, so to speak, you'll find someone who's got your stuff. But it's a good question to ask. Yeah, I'll add to that because um, I know we're going backwards a little bit back to cast of characters. But um, when you're choosing any service provider, whether it's a lawyer or an accountant or somebody, there needs to be a fit. Um, I have seen smaller you know, emerging managers uh, looking for the biggest law firm on the block. Uh, you know, the thousand lawyer law, uh, international law firm, um, because they feel that that might give them an edge in raising capital um, or going to the big four accounting firms, you know, analogous, you know, the 10,000 accountant firm that's all over the world, um, but not necessarily getting the best service. Um, because I think just like with your doctor, you need to find um, the right practitioner for your needs and your budget. And that will have the time to, um, I guess this isn't really great for the doctor analogy, but you know, the, the um, service provider that is geared towards servicing um, managers with your level of AUM. So um, responsiveness is key, not just expertise, but responsiveness and budget are really important. And having um, you know, somebody you can pick up the phone and call um, and get on the line isn't always easy depending on which service provider you're working with. Um, and you, know, you wanna make sure they're putting you know, the best people on your matter, regardless of uh, what, or depending on what the size is of your fund. And one more thought on that too, Jonathan, because that's 100% accurate. Uh, and that is whom you're going to be dealing with on a regular basis at those firms. So in other words, there was I won't get into the war story now, but there was a major uh, screw up on a Cayman uh, fund for a hedge fund that I was working with. And they completely botched uh, a season and sell formation, UBTI issue. And I'll just throw those terms out. But the point was, we I caught the the error, the mistake, and the managers were furious because their accounting firm and law firm uh, both missed it and their fundraiser guy caught it, which makes no sense. And we did a whole post-mortem. And the problem was, it was a huge accounting firm and a big law firm. The problem was they were dealing with, you know, after somebody brought them in, they were dealing with somebody only a few years out of school who completely missed the issue because they've only been practicing a few years. I've been doing this now for 20. So, you know, when I say the Evan special, you're, the Evan special means you're getting a a good starter rate, but you're still dealing with some of the senior people at the firm. Now, obviously, you know, they will oversee the matter, but they still have to be in the picture because if they pass you off to, you know, Billy Bob, who just graduated law school or got his CPA a year ago, that's not where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's move on. Um, we did get a question about high water marks, by the way. Um, don't want to gloss over that. Um, high water marks are important, especially in hedge funds. So, um, is, is the question was, is that the same as a hurdle? Um, so I'll just say with high water marks, essentially it is um, a mechanism all in investors in hedge funds expect to see, um, uh, where you basically the manager looks back at the highest level of performance. Um, in the in the prior accounting period, and must exceed that in the next year in order to take a performance for your performance allocation. And there are um, capital accounting mechanisms for um, for tracking that. But essentially, if you're a fund manager and you don't meet the high water mark that you established in the previous year, um, you don't get a you don't get a performance allocation. Um, until you're able to beat that in the next accounting period. And I, I def, def, definitely remember um, during the, the market crash and dislocation um, following Madoff, there were fund managers who were going for um, years without making their 
uh, performance allocation, they were running on management fees because uh, markets were down, people were pulling out of their funds, their AUMs were down, um, and some were closing up shop uh, just so they could start a new fund and start uh, uh, calculating their high water mark anew because they just could not beat uh, and beat the prior high water marks and, and develop what are called uh, you know new net profits in the next succeeding accounting period or accounting periods. Um, so yeah, that's that's critical, and um, it's a it's a combination of legal and accounting uh, knowledge to get that right. Yeah, John, let me say one quick thing on top of that. It can be a real issue. You know, the notion of the high water mark is if you've made a performance fee on the way up, and then you've got a drawdown, you don't get your performance fee till each investor, that particular investor, is now has recovered from the drawdown, is making profits again. So a real yeah. critical, real critical lesson for managers is. Do not distribute to yourselves, your employees, your staff, and your partners 100% of your carry interest during the good years. What you need to do is to squirrel away some portion of that because if and when you have a drawdown, and most firms will, you can then take some of the squirreled away profits that you saved somewhere and use that to pay your employees. Because to your point, Jonathan, what can happen is if you haven't done that and you're below your high watermark, you're going to lose talent for people who may go to other firms that are doing better than you or have trouble attracting talent if you're below your high water mark, where if you saved some and squirreled some away, you've got a much better ability to maintain the staff you've got and even hire new people because you're not just running on the management fees. It's, it's a critical lesson. A lot of folks got it right in 08, 09, and 010, but a lot of folks got it wrong and they discovered they had never put anything away for the rainy day. So treat your hedge and venture firm and your hedge fund like your own family's money. Don't spend everything you've got save some for a rainy day. You might need it someday. Yeah, okay. Now I'm trying to get to the next slide. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag. Let's see if we can get beyond it. Yeah, okay. Apologies for the awkward pause. Well, now I'm working for some reason. Well, while we're waiting for that to happen, let me just, uh, I'm gonna pull this up on my, I don't know if you can see the PDF that I've got up on my screen. If not, um, let's just talk about um, typical private fund investors, Evan, um, and who to approach. So um, there are two major categories. Um, from a legal standpoint, I'll just say there, as I mentioned before, they're accredited investors and they're qualified purchasers. Um, and real briefly, I'll run through that. Accredited investors are either individuals who make $200,000 a year or $300,000 jointly with their spouse. They meet a net worth test of a million dollars um, as an alternative to the um, income test. You have to exclude your prime, primary residence from that net worth calculation. Their family offices with $5 million in assets or investments. Um, Entities owned by accredited investors and certain licensed individuals. Those are the typical accredited investors, qualified purchasers of the heavy hitters, uh, you know, the institutionals, anybody owning $5 million in investments um, and uh, or have a discretionary investment authority over $25 million in investments. Um, Evan, if, if I'm a fund manager and I'm going out there for the first time, um, who should I be approaching first? Um, should I be going after the uh, institutional investors right away? Is that the, the best approach? Sure, great question. Well, your question said you're going after the first time. So hopefully while you are a first time fund and that's a term people use a first time fund, hopefully you have a prior life someplace where you did what you do at a prior hedge fund or a, private, uh, a prior private equity fund. So it's really not your first rodeo as they say. Uh, because it can be real tough if it is, because uh, why should you give money to someone who's never invested before? So hopefully, and we'll get to that maybe later, you have a prior track record that hopefully you can use from a legal and business standpoint. But to answer your question, Jonathan, uh, the conventional wisdom, which is 85% true, is uh, your first investors, like I said before, are going to be friends and family, former colleagues, former employees you, you've worked with, but then it's going to be the family offices. The family offices tend to go earlier. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, sometimes they're smaller than the institutions. So, you know, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, uh, Stanford, Columbia, 
you know, Columbia's got a great endowment. We know a lot of people there. You know, they typically, you know, they're running billions of dollars and they need to put 25 or 50 or $100 million in a manager. And they're not going to give a startup manager typically $100 million when the fund is only 50. So you're typically going to have to uh, put the universities, the endowments, the pensions, the insurance companies I'd hold and go to the family offices. The other thing also too is quite frankly, uh, a lot of this is career risk, not for the manager, but for the investor. The family offices, it's their money. And if a family office wants to give you 5 million, 50 million or 100 million or any number in between, they can give you that money. And if you do great, terrific. If you don't, it's their money. You know, a lot of the bigger institutions and it's you know, one of the best kept or worst kept secrets, there are people who work there. And if things go great, uh, they get a little bit more credit, maybe in a pat on the back, but if things go badly, they can lose their job. So typically, uh, the folks who work at the biggest places are only going to recommend huge entities that have been around a long time. So yes, the, the family offices are typically the first investors after friends and family. Uh, they typically will write smaller checks, two, three, five, 10 million, although obviously some of them may go to 25 or 50. Uh, but the exception is there are a bunch of uh, endowments and other institutional investors that have so-called, you know, in air quotes, emerging manager programs. And that is one of the things that we're obviously, if we're raising money for an emerging manager, we're not only going to go to the couple of hundred family offices that we know who typically do emerging managers, but we're going to go to the three or four dozen huge places that have so-called emerging manager programs. So, you know, the most important thing about fundraising and sales is as the expression goes to be fishing in the right pond. If you've got a great fund, but you're only 25 or 50 million and you hire a fundraiser, and this comes to who, whom you hire, and you hire a fundraiser who's only been at big shops and only knows huge universities and sovereign wealth funds and CalPERS uh, and folks like that who have to invest $100 million a shot, you're not gonna do very well. So yes, the answer is 85% of your first investors will be family offices and maybe 15% the endowments and foundations and institutional investors that have so-called emerging manager programs or platforms. And our family offices, um, you know, are they seeing um, great investment returns by investing in emerging managers? Is that what you're typically seeing, Evan? Well, okay, I'll give you three answers for one question, three for the price of one. The first thing is emerging managers tend to outperform. Uh, we have thousands of white papers and studies in our research files. And the evidence is clear. Emerging managers in the hedge fund and other space tend to outperform by several hundred basis points a year. Obviously there's exceptions. There are some horrible emerging managers and some great huge funds, but they do tend to outperform when they're younger, hungrier, not resting on their laurels. You know, They don't have a billion dollars and tens of millions of management fees. They don't have five jets and six yachts yet. They don't have any jets, they have no yachts. They're nimble, they're hungry, they're working longer hours. They're not resting on their laurels. So you can get great returns from emerging managers. Uh, this, all, this, uh, all the studies show it. And a lot of family offices do get great returns by investing in emerging managers. There are some family offices and endowments and foundations that only invest in emerging managers uh, or largely invest in emerging managers. Uh, so that is definitely one of the, you know, you have to be, again, fishing in the right pond. And, and one more thing I'll say about, depends on your strategy. Uh, and again, this is pretty well known in the business. Most family offices, or let me come at another way, most endowments, foundations, and pensions, most endowments, uh, all the major ones, they're looking to hit singles and doubles. They're looking to make five to 10 to 15% on most of their investments so they can meet their pension obligations, make the endowment grow. They're not looking to hit home runs. They're looking to sleep at night and they're looking for singles and doubles. And they're non taxable, so 10, 15% a year, eight, 10, 15 in great years 20, that's fantastic. The family offices are taxable. And if you're a family office in a high tax state like New York or California, your marginal tax rate is gonna be, depending upon your deductions and whatnot, you know, somewhere in the 30 some percent range. So the family offices tend to be looking for singles, doubles, triples, and a home run or two, and they'll take a strikeout or two. So in terms of matching your fund to the right fundraiser, to the right investor, what I'm saying is this, if you're starting out, skew more towards family office and the emerging manager programs. But you know, if your track record is more singles and doubles, the endowments and foundations might like you where the family offices are not gonna be blown away if you make 8% every year. You want, so you have to consider all those things, the type of strategy, your size and your stage 
and figuring out which investors to go to. And if you work for with a top firm, a top fundraising firm, you have a top fundraising partner, he, she, or it will know this like the back of their hand. Uh, and I assume uh, any family office uh, investor or other investor will want to know that you have the right structure in place um, to accommodate their money. So um, I wanted to just talk about certain fund structures. I know we're getting a little low on time here. So I'm going to try to breeze through these pretty quickly. There are um, for domestic fund structures, um, there's the two-party and the three-party structure. Two-party structure is essentially the fund, which is, as I said, a limited partnership or a limited liability company, um, which is managed by one entity, which wears two hats, the general partner hat and the investment manager hat, meaning it controls everything um, relating to the fund, whether to admit um, investors, whether to let investors out, um, to make tax decisions. Um, it also collects all the income streams from the fund. So the carry or the performance allocation um, and the management fees all go to one entity. This is the simplest form of fund. And as you can see, um, it's really two boxes. You could ignore the prime broker uh, box on the right there because uh, unless this is a hedge fund. A hedge fund would have a prime broker. Um, if it's a, a venture fund uh, or private equity fund, um, it would not. Um, the three-party structure is the typical fund structure, especially for managers in New York, um, but it can also work for um, managers anywhere. Um, this uh, bifurcates the duties of the general partner and the investment advisor. So the general partner is still the administrative entity for the fund. Um, and we say it manages the day-to-day -day affairs of the fund and generally collects the performance-based compensation. The investment advisor is the um, other entity, um, makes all the trading decisions for the fund, makes all investment management decisions for the fund and usually receives the management company. What's interesting with um, this structure and why it works is the investment advisor is the persistent entity. So if you're thinking about building out your business, um, going to funds two, three, et cetera, the investment advisor doesn't change. Um, it manages the assets of all of the funds in its stable of products and receives management fees um, in exchange for the services it's providing to all the funds. Plus it's where all the intellectual property is housed, um, the branding, the logos, uh, the employees sit at the invest, generally sit at the investment advisor level. Um, the general partner, on the other hand, you generally establish a new general partner for each successor fund. And uh, there are liability reasons for that. You want to separate the liabilities of each general partner from the other. Um, uh, and when I say liabilities, where do those come from? Generally, your investors, if they want to bring a suit for anything, if they're disgruntled, there are losses in the fund, or they view you as having breached a fiduciary duty, you don't want them suing a single entity that manages all of the funds. You want to kind of segregate each general partner in each fund from the liabilities of the other. Um, I want Jonathan, to give one thing. Yeah. Sorry, uh, real, real quick, one thing there too. Part of the reason they had the separate general partner for many years and often still do, especially in the hedge fund space, but in mo many funds is the carried interest because it, the notion was you wanted to have a very clean separation if you had some tax advantage in your fund as a manager. So you had an investment manager that managed provided services and got paid a fee that's ordinary income. But then you also had a general partner that got the allocation, which might have some tax advantage. And the notion was that when the IRS looked at you, you had sort of this Berlin wall or Chinese wall between the two to try to bolster your position that the carried interest was truly tax advantage and it wasn't real uh, ordinary income for running the fund. So that's we get into that deeper in a different call perhaps, but that's one of the reasons why they've had these two entities from a historical perspective. Yes, in New York, the, the, the tax issue there is the unincorporated business tax. Um, so the management fee, I'm oh, sorry, the, the unincorporated business tax affects 
unincorporated, unincorporated entities like partnerships and LLCs. And um, it's a 4% tax on fee income that um, is paid to pass-through entities like LPs and LLCs. So the conventional wisdom still followed today, and it's the, the common blueprint, is to separate the general partner and the investment advisors so that the unincorporated business tax, again, this is a New York City tax, um, it would apply only to the management fee income and not, quote unquote, taint the, comp the performance-based compensation that the general partner has. Um, if you get on the phone with um, any tax practitioner, though, they will have some quibbles and disagreements with that, particularly if the GP and the investment advisor are owned by the exact same people. Um, there's always a risk that the New York tax authorities will collapse the structure and, and say, you know, notwithstanding the form, the, uh, the tax applies to um, all, all of the income, though I don't know of any case where that has actually transpired. Uh, maybe somebody in the audience knows, but um, I haven't heard of it. Um, we'll get into offshore fund structures real briefly. There are tax reasons, again, um, for setting up a fund structure offshore. Um, the domicile is typically the Cayman Islands or British Virgin Islands, um, because those are zero tax jurisdictions with very well developed um, uh, legal regimes. Uh, designed specifically to um, attract uh, investment funds. But by the way, those are by no means the only two offshore jurisdictions that can accommodate um, you know, uh, offshore funds. Uh, Luxembourg, Ireland, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, uh, Guernsey, there are many other places. I probably have left out others. Some of, some of these places are low tax or zero tax jurisdictions. <clears throat> you better believe that um, the commerce departments for all of these different nations um, are trying very hard to attract uh, more capital and invest, especially investment funds. Um, the, we can't get into you know, the pros and cons of each of those jurisdictions, but typically, for US-based managers, the Cayman Islands and the BBI are the, are the most common and easy to work with jurisdictions. And I know lawyers and accountants in, in both, um, they're mostly uh, British uh, and have very sophisticated um, and long-term long careers working with fund managers. So um, I can certainly refer anybody to um, offshore practi practitioners if they need them. Um, but from a tax perspective, why would you set one up? Um, well, for if you're attracting offshore investors, um, those offshore investors typically want to be put into a vehicle that is outside the U.S. tax net, and they don't have to report their income directly to the IRS. So an offshore vehicle works. You can also check the box to obtain uh, U.S. tax treatment as a corporation, even if the entity is established as a a Cayman limited partnership. So there's flexibility in determining um, how that entity, entity should be treated uh, to accommodate the unique tax circumstances for your investors. Um, and uh, US tax exempt investors also want to be investing in a corporate offshore blocker entity to avoid what's called unrelated business taxable income, which is uh, um, income generated from borrowing activities. Um, and so Evan, I know you've dealt with some tax exempt investors. Um, you know, even if let's say we set up a, a US fund that um, specifically prohibits um, generating UBTI in its strategy, could a manager say, look, I want to save some money and just establish a domestic fund. As long as I put something in the documents that says I won't generate UBTI, can I then market this structure to a tax exempt investor like a pension fund? Sure, great, great question. Uh, two, two answers again, two for the price of one. Uh, real quick, the first point is in terms of what jurisdiction, stick to Delaware and Cayman or BVI because from an investor standpoint, again, picture somebody on a 3 a.m. red eye with a stack full or a computer full of PPMs and PowerPoints, including your fund, and they're going through all of them. And again, it's check the box. So when they get to your fund, 
you know, auditors they know, law firm they know, administrator they know, Delaware they know, even if there's a reason for doing some other state, you're, you're asking to be dinged or put in the back burner, stick, keep it straight down the fairway as the golfer stay. stick to Delaware, Cayman, BVI, like Jonathan said. And the other thing is this, even if you are not gonna have UBTI and there's no legal or accounting reason why you cannot have just a US fund, as Jonathan alluded, from a marketing standpoint and from a business standpoint, a fundraising standpoint, if I've got to start explaining to everybody at one of our investors all this stuff about why, we, why they're not going into the Cayman Fund as always, maybe I get it past them. But then when it gets up to the investment committee and their lawyers and their investment committee, you don't want to be the fund that's doing something seen as fancy so even if you're right and you've got a letter from Jonathan and Wigan and from a big four accounting firm saying why you can do it, you're going to lose investors. And you know the investors we work with do 25 to 200 million dollars per investor per fund. So you may save 50 grand in setup costs, and it may cost you, you know, five million a year in fees. So to your point, you know, give investors what they're looking for because the ROI on that Cayman fund. The formation costs that came in fund, you know, could be 50x or 100x the additional fees you get. And lastly, even if you're right, what if you forget a couple of years later that you can't do X, Y, or Z because you've only got a domestic fund and one of your PMs forgets or someone on the team forgets and you generate UBTI, you commit a footfall, you don't want that happening. So, you know, it's that old commercial, you can pay me now or pay me later. Better to build the house with a solid foundation, with known service providers and known domiciles for your entities than trying to fix things later on or getting fancy. And lastly, the same thing goes with your fee structures. We may get to that, we may not. Keep your fee structures standard. Don't come up with fee structures that are different and unusual, even if they're better, even if you're right, you'll lose a lot more investors than you could imagine. Yeah. And here on the screen is uh, what, I, what I would call a typical master feeder fund structure. Um, though this is inverted, I didn't have time to draw a, a better one. This is pulled from a treatise, um, but um, usually I, I draw the master fund at the bottom. But essentially, you have um, a domestic limited partnership, limited partnership there on the left, that um, pools investor capital from U.S. limited partners. Um, on the one hand, then you have XYZ feeder fund, which is an offshore feeder fund. On the other hand, that is set up in an offshore jurisdiction like the Cayman Islands. And uh, the investors in that fund are either non-US investors or the tax exempt US investors we uh, briefly touched upon. Those two feeder funds feed into the master fund. Their sole investment objective is to just invest in the master fund. So if the master fund is a say a Cayman limited partnership, then it's a limited partnership with two partners, uh, the domestic feeder fund and the offshore feeder fund. And um, if it's if the master fund is set up as a corporation, it has two shareholders, um, the feeder fund, the domestic feeder fund and the offshore feeder fund. Um, fees often, uh, fees and performance-based compensation are often taken at the master fund level. Um, and this uh, diagram is actually missing the uh, general partner and investment manager entity and where the fees go. So let me um, move this forward. And Jonathan, one question. Quick. Yeah. Just, just to prove I'm a recovering lawyer, if I remember this correctly, when I started out doing this in about 2004, if I recall correctly, 3C1 funds, the accredited investor funds, cannot be part of the master feeder. Only 3C7 funds can feed into that. Is that still the situation? Do I remember that correctly? Um, you can have a 3C1 fund feeding into a master fund. Um, you're probably getting uh, to the look-through rules, the attribution rules for 3C1. Um, we can discuss that uh, a little bit later, but yes, you can have a 3C1 fund in, um, feeding into a master fund, um, but you do have to keep in mind um, attribution rules there. And um, I, know, I know what you're getting at. We can uh, discuss that um, at, uh, at another time. <laughs> um, but the, you know, I wanted to just show you what a more complex master feeder structure looks like. Um, and this has uh, 
you know, all of the entities, what I call the upper tier entities built into it. This is a real structure that I developed for a venture capital fund manager that wanted to establish a um, venture capital master fund and have two venture funds feeding into it. Um, you can see, um, even it has the, the triangles representing pass-through entities for US tax purposes, rectangles representing corporate taxation. Um, the Delaware Feeder Fund here um, has its own general partner. Um, in this case, the general partner was there to um, receive the uh, carried interest from the offshore fund. So we were taking, um, well, actually, no, I take that back. Um, all This is a structure where all um, management fees and other compensation were taken at the master fund level. And there was a special master general partner established offshore. Uh, the right On the right-hand side, that's the offshore side. <clears throat> it was designed to um, take carry and ma uh, management fees from the master fund. The general partner in the US was there really as an administrative GP. Um, also, if any carry needed to be taken at the feeder fund level for whatever reason, um, you could stick a, uh, an employee into that entity if it were, you know, if it was deemed to be necessary, or if you wanted to have uh, like a seed investor come in and capitalize the, the GP or the, the onshore fund, you could have that too. Um, but you could see US taxable investors, again, went into the onshore feeder fund, uh, tax exempt and foreign investors went into the offshore feeder fund. You had an offshore investment manager called XYZ Ventures Limited there, also set up offshore. Um, and this was really useful because the management team was comprised of both US and non-US individuals. Um, and the US uh, individual was going to be taxed um, on his share of income from the fund, regardless of where um, it was situated because that's how US, the US tax regime works. But the non-US members of the management team did not want to be taxed on uh, their share of the income. So we put them in an offshore uh, master general partner. And, um, and that's how that worked. And you could see the flow of funds there. There's a uh, uh, you know, management fee going to the BBI manager periodically, carried interest going to the offshore master general partner. And um, uh, this is a little bit more complex, but I, uh, I personally was uh, enjoyed creating it. It, uh, it. it felt like it solved a lot of problems and uh, the client was, uh, was happy with that. Uh, this is a private equity fund structure, not terribly different. Um, the, again, you have a GP as, as separate from the investment advisor. The only difference here um, is uh, there isn't much of a difference. Um, again, private fund is investing in portfolio companies instead of um, instead of publicly traded securities, for example. Um, and to the extent there are any fees generated by the portfolio companies that could be paid directly over to the investment advisor. Um, um, here's an even more complicated structure where you have a main fund, a feeder fund, and a parallel fund, and an, what's a so-called AIV or an alternative investment vehicle. Um, these are all uh, set up for different reasons. Um, we were talking about 3C1 and 3C7 funds before. Um, you could have a main fund being a 3C1 fund or the 3C7 fund rather. The parallel fund could be a 3C1 fund for friends and family, and they invest on a peri pussy basis into underlying um, securities, portfolio securities, portfolio companies. Um, you could have a feeder fund going into the main fund if you have if you want to accommodate offshore investors. So you could have an offshore feeder fund feeding into a domestic main fund in this case. Um, the AIV is usually a special vehicle set up for certain kinds of investors that have unique tax or regulatory um, uh, circumstances, and they don't wanna be commingled with investors in the main or parallel funds. So you set up a special vehicle just for them. That could also be um, like a sidecar vehicle, um, just uh, for the purpose of investing in a select 
portion of the portfolio that the main fund and parallel fund invest in. So we don't have much time left. I think we're actually at the end, but we sort of got into uh, you know, marketing to investors. I know a lot of people were asking questions about that. Um, Santosh is uh, moderating this uh, time-wise. I don't know if there is um, sufficient interest in going for another five minutes or so. We could either talk about this or just uh, answer questions directly. Um, we, we can go about 15, you know, about to 7.30. So, you know, answer some questions for sure. Okay. Well, somebody asked Evan in the in the chat um, about what makes for a compelling track record for an emerging manager who does not have portfolio management experience. Um, that's a gr great question. It probably could be its own discussion separate from this one. But Evan, do you have um, like a two minute answer for that one? Because it's 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 a it's probably top of mind for a lot of people. Yeah, Jonathan, sure. That is a three beer conversation, but I'll give the TLDR version in about 60 seconds. Um, we I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think what they're getting at is someone maybe was the number two or number three person, maybe at a large or medium sized hedge fund, and he or she has now spun out to form their own. And this is a very tricky question with regard to track record, uh, because if you were the number two or three person at your prior firm, you probably can't claim the track record both from a contractual standpoint, because your old contract says you won't, and also from a regulatory SEC standpoint, because you weren't the person pulling the trigger and you also don't have the documents to back it up. So we have worked with folks who've been the number two or three person at a fund to try to figure out what they can say to support the fact that now they're gonna be running the money themselves. Uh, I should also mention too, I know there's a bunch of questions about fundraising uh, on the Crawford Ventures website on the Crawford Ventures homepage. I think it's about halfway down. We have a 40 some slide PowerPoint with about 55 tips and tricks about fundraising. So if we don't get a chance to cover everything, feel free to take a look at that. I think there's a video along there as well. But yeah, if, if you don't have a track record, it is very challenging to come up with a cogent way of saying what you did at your prior firm. But as I like to say, if you tell the truth and you're not misleading and you give all the facts, you, you start with friends and family but it is very challenging if you don't have a track record and maybe you've got to do friends and family for two to three years, if it's say a hedge fund and build a two to three year track record or maybe even 18 months with your own fund plus five, 10 or 15 years with another firm where you were the number two or three person might be enough to tip the scales. But you know, it's very challenging because you know, would you give 50 or hundred million dollars to someone to run where they've never run money before themselves? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, another question for you, Evan, I knew you'd be popular today. Um, how much does it cost to raise capital of a hundred million dollars with a decent track record? So now we have somebody with a track record that's good with top decile performance and how much time would it take to bring capital to the fund? Um, also, what is the typical time it will take to launch the fund? So cost to raise capital of a hundred million dollars. It's interesting. Um, are there costs associated with raising $100 million? Well, Jonathan, sure. I think you've now summarized why I went from being a lawyer to a fundraiser, because you, you become the popular person in the room when you can bring money. Uh, yeah. But I think there's there's three <laughs> questions there. Uh, the first question is, how long does it take to, to create or I think they mean to form the fund? And that's, you know, with the right lawyers and accountants, not days, not weeks, say months, not years, say months, depends how quickly everybody moves. The second question is, you know, how long does it take to raise a fund? And I will give uh, you and all the uh, Columbia alums my standard answer, which is, do you want the honest answer or the one you want to hear? Because it is, uh, it'll take you longer than you thought, but that's it. You know, it takes time. It's the typical hockey stick. You know, it can take you know six to eighteen months to really get a lot of traction, and a lot of it depends upon how quickly you move and how good your fundraiser is and how many investors he or she knows. But it typically takes a couple of months to get the word out, a couple of months to get investor meetings, a couple of months for due diligence. You know, it's sort of like taking a car from a dead stop. And I don't mean the fancy Tesla cars, your, your traditional old gas car to get a car going from zero to 60. It takes a while to get into first gear, second gear and third gear. So the honest answer is, you know, it can take a few months to get everything in place and it can take six to 18 months to raise 
you know, $100 million or more, uh, which is why it's critical, again, not to repeat myself, to have great service providers, a great fundraiser, uh, standard terms, standard fee structures, because that, that can make all the difference in the world. And one sort of last thought on this point is probably the biggest mistake I see is the following. It is very easy to form a hedge fund. It's very easy to get to first base, if you will, with a hedge fund or a private equity fund or a venture fund or a real estate fund. It's very easy to form it, but some people don't put aside the working capital to build it because you want good service providers. And even with the Evans Special, they don't work for free. And you're gonna need some number of employees and they don't work for free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, what I say to people is, you know, if you and I are gonna open up the world's greatest Italian or French restaurant, we've got to put $2 million at risk or a million dollars risk, whatever it costs. If you're forming a hedge or a venture or a private equity firm, it's not just $50,000 for a great lawyer or $100,000 for a great lawyer and accounting firm. It's having that sort of million dollars of expendable capital to build the firm up over a year or two. You know, otherwise, you may be the world's greatest $10, $15 million firm for the next several dozen years. So those are some points to bear in mind. You, know, you do have to put some capital commitment and time behind it, but it does hockey stick. And if, even with the top decimal track record, you still have to get the right people, people, processes, procedures, and service providers in place because the days of, uh, what's that expression? Build it and they will come. Those days are gone. I know a lot of top decimal managers who haven't broken the $25 million barrier or the $50 million barrier for years because they never invested enough in their company and brought on the right people, including fundraisers and so forth. So uh, it's a process, but you'll make it. Yeah. Um, another anonymous attendee asked, um, a growing number of PMs of SEC registered hedge funds have a presence on Twitter, have interviews on YouTube, make letters, uh, performance publicly available, et cetera. Does merely having a public presence constitute advertising or is there room for 506B funds to take, to take these actions while staying within the line? So awesome question. Um, again, could spend a you know great deal of time answering it. Um, I think the answer um, has to be um, given in the context of the new marketing rule that the SEC passed um, some time ago, but is set to go into effect in November of this year. So the SEC just rewrote the marketing rules applicable to fund managers, a huge release, hundreds of pages long. Um, but in it, they spend a great deal of time defining advertisement. And what's interesting is, um, and is how, they, how they defined the term advertising is not merely having a presence, but having a presence that advertises the fund manager's services. So if, for example, you have, um, you've paid for a billboard, um, say at the US Open, and it just says XYZ Management LLC and nothing else, that actually is not an advertisement as defined under the new marketing rule. And by extension, if you merely have a presence on say Twitter or LinkedIn, it just says, um, I'm Mr. or Ms. Uh, XYZ, and I work for XYZ Investment Management Company. That alone probably isn't an advertisement under the definition of the rule, um, but it's what you do while online. So if you are, obviously, if you are promoting the fact that you have a fund and you're taking in investors right now, it's clear in that, clearly an advertisement, you're probably in violation of rule 506B um, and you could lose your regulation D exemption or be subject to other penalties. Um, so the answer is a little bit more nuanced. You may not be engaged in an advertisement, but it depends on the facts and circumstances. Um, and I think a lot of managers should have in their policies and procedures, a prohibition on um, a lot of activity that could even be, um, that could be deemed or interpreted to be um, active solicitations of a privately offered fund. Um, so, but if, by the way, if all you're doing is talking about generally about the markets, it may, depending again, what you're saying, may or may not be enough to rise to the level of an advertisement. Um, but um, 
clearly you should involve counsel and a chief compliance officer if you have one to evaluate what you are doing um, and to be to be extra cautious. Um, let's uh, keep moving. A bunch of questions here. Um, what are some of the things an emerging manager can do in the early days to increase the odds of attracting institutional capital once a two to three year successful track record has been established? All right, you want to field that one or? Um, well, I think we did touch upon that. Uh, having a great team and service providers around you is key. I also said really early, um, what, is a, what is a don't? Um, and I said it's a de deferring your focus on compliance. I think having a good compliance, and compliance can mean a, a lot to many people, to many different people. As a lawyer, I think of compliance as just reducing regulatory risk. But I think as a fund manager, you should be thinking of compliance as a way to position yourself to attract institutional capital later on. It can be actually an ally. Legal and compliance can be an ally uh, to you as you go out and market to uh, institutional investors. Um, so what do I mean by compliance? Act like a registered investment advisor, even if you aren't a registered investment advisor. Again, that's lawyerly advice. A lot of people might disagree with me as business people. They may say, well, why would I want to invest in that? It's a big headache. Maybe I got to hire some people I don't want to pay. Um, you know, I, I, I now have to now I have to have a compliance manual. Now I have to have a code of ethics. Now I need to think long and hard about instituting a business continuity and recovery plan. But I think those are the kinds of things that any institutional investor would expect you to have. And it's also just um, uh, a way to um, differentiate yourself from other investment managers that may not want to invest in that side of the business. Again, it shows you have a long-term view. You're not building um, a business with a short-term you know, uh, view, you know, two to three years and you're out. This is a 20 year to 30 year business that you're building um, and having a good compliance program um, where you act like a registered investment advisor, even if you aren't registered, I think is, is a good approach. Um, uh, also the terms that you're offering to investors, that's a whole other discussion. And I, I was going to get to that today, but I don't think we're gonna get into that. Um, maybe, maybe when we do, uh, you know, um, 2.0 of this presentation later this year, we could talk about different structures, how to, how to, for example, attract a seed investor into your fund, how to onboard, you know, talent into the GP. Um, you know, so the next portfolio manager is well compensated to, to bring the best returns. And those are the kinds of things you can do to attract institutional capital. Jonathan, two points real quick. The first thing is that a lot of those, quote, regulatory burdens, the compliance manual, the best practices, the cybersecurity, the succession planning, a lot of those, quote, regulatory burdens are actually very good ideas. In other words, don't, don't fight them. A lot of the things that the regulators want actually make great sense from a business standpoint. They're prudent. And so take their advice and implement them even when you're small. And also from a fundraising standpoint, if you're an emerging manager, make sure you do have a fundraiser who knows emerging manager, emerging manager investors in your space, because some of the disasters I've seen, like Santos said, what not to do. I see an emerging hedge fund manager say, have a fundraiser who came from the mutual fund business, knew nobody who invests in hedge funds. I've seen emerging manager hedge funds have a fundraiser who came from a billion dollar shop who only knew the multi-billion dollar investors, but didn't know the several hundred allocators who will do emerging managers. So it's got to be the right fit from a legal standpoint and from a business standpoint, both. Yeah. And then the last comment to address uh, was advanced early or early happy birthday, Evan. I didn't realize May 17th is your birthday, somebody said. Um, I, that's not a question. It's just a, maybe a nice parting comment. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, 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 thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me know where the party is and I will, uh, I will be there. Thanks very much. An anonymous attendee. So, um, whoever that is, maybe you could put your name in the chat. Cause that was very nice. Um, that's, um, I think that's pr pr probably a good stopping point. I know there's, there's more to cover, but, um, maybe we'll, we'll do that, this again, uh, later this year, uh, Cindy and Santos.
Yeah, I think we've already got some comments to that effect in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great job, guys. Great material really great. and uh, and excellent engagement from the audience. So looking forward to doing another one of these when the two of you are able to do so. Great. Absolutely. We'd love to do it. So and I, of course, maybe I'll, let me just skip down to, uh, well, I think we, you'll, you'll be sending out uh, contact info to um, the yes. attendees. If anybody has a, a question that um, um, for us that they want, would prefer to ask offline, um, happy to uh, happy to do that. Right. And if you and I know there's not a lot of Jonathan Golub lawyers. If you Google Jonathan Golub at Wigan and Dana or Evan Katz at Crawford Ventures, it comes right up <laughs> in Google. But now thank thank you to uh, Columbia and to Santosh and Cindy and to the alumni who attended. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, I really enjoyed the presentation and happy to answer questions. And thanks for the birthday wishes, whoever put those out there. And they were accurate, I guess. <laughs> it was your birthday. It is your birthday soon. It's great. Right. <laughs> Anyway, thank you both. And on behalf of everyone, we kept the audience going till 7.30. So that shows you we really loved it. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm glad. As I said, I try not to be too dry in the, in the delivery. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope everybody agrees. Well, we do. And that's a wrap. So I will hit the end button and we will talk to you offline. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good Thanks, Santa. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.